Dr. Robert Goddard is known as the father of modern rocketry. He designed, tested, and built the world's first functional liquid fuel rockets and solved all the fundamental problems of liquid fuel rocketry. Inventing and building new technologies, he went on to be one of the most significant figures in astronautics. But how did he get there? This is the story of Dr. Robert H. Goddard. Dr. Robert Hutchins Goddard was born on October 5, 1882. He is an American engineer, physicist, professor, and inventor. With a curiosity about nature, he began to study the night sky using a telescope that his father had given him. Goddard became interested in studying outer space when he read H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. In 1913, Goddard in his spare time using calculus developed the mathematics which had allowed him to calculate the position and velocity of a rocket in vertical flight. By 1916, he began searching for potential sponsors to help finance his work and began with the Smithsonian Institution. In his letter to the Smithsonian, Goddard claimed to have achieved 63% efficiency and a nozzle velocity of almost 2,134 meters per second. The Smithsonian became interested and asked that Goddard elaborate upon his initial inquiry. He responded with a detailed manuscript he had already prepared titled A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. In 1917, the Smithsonian agreed to provide Goddard with a five-year grant. Dr. Arthur G. Webster realized that Goddard had accomplished a good deal of fine work and insisted that Goddard publish his progress. So Goddard asked the Smithsonian Institution if it would publish the report he had submitted in late 1916. In 1919, the Smithsonian published Goddard's groundbreaking work, A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. The report describes Goddard's mathematical theories of rocket flight, his experiments with solid fuel rockets, and the possibilities he saw of exploring the Earth's atmosphere and beyond. The publication of Dr. Robert Goddard's document gained him national attention from U.S. newspapers, but the vast majority of it negative. The press at the time sensationalized his ideas to the point of misrepresentation and ridicule. Even the Smithsonian had to withdraw from publicity on the topic because of the negative correspondence from the general public. David Lasser, one of the co-founders of the American Rocket Society, wrote in 1931 that Goddard was subjected to the most violent attacks. On January 12, 1920, a front-page story titled Believes Rocket Can Reach Moon reported the Smithsonian press release about a multi-charge, high-efficiency rocket. The day after the front-page story on Goddard's rocket, Topics of the Times, an editorial page feature of the New York Times, scoffed at Goddard's proposal. The article titled A Severe Strain and Credulity commented on Dr. Goddard's published work stating that Professor Goddard, with his chair at Clark College in the contendency of the Smithsonian Institution, does not know the relation of action to reaction. And of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react, to say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. No matter how he tried to explain his results, he was not understood. After one of Goddard's experiments in 1929, a local Worcester newspaper published the mocking headline, Moon Rocket Misses Target by 238,799.5 Miles. Because of harsh criticism from the media and other scientists, and understanding better than most the military applications for which foreign powers could use this technology, Goddard became increasingly suspicious of others and often worked alone. A major limiting factor was the lack of support from the American government, military, and academia to study the atmosphere, near space, and military applications. However, as Germany became ever more warlike, he received more and more correspondence from German rocket scientists even though he refused to communicate with the German rocket experimenters. Goddard began experimenting with liquid fuel rockets in 1921. In 1925, Goddard conducted a static test on a simple pressure feed system similar to present-day rocket turbopumps at Clark University. In January 1926, Goddard moved to begin testing a possible launch of a full rocket system. As recalled by Goddard's wife, Esther Goddard, he told me this great excitement that that afternoon at his laboratory, his little liquid propellant rocket motor had lifted its own weight and even a little more. Now it is ready to take out into the open, he said. Dr. Goddard launched the world's first liquid fuel rocket on March 16, 1926 in Auburn, Massachusetts with his crew chief Henry Sachs, assistant professor Percy Roop, and Goddard's wife Esther Goddard. Goddard's achievement is considered to be just as significant as the Wright brothers' first flight. After a rocket launch in 1929, he gained the attention of the newspapers, and this time, of Charles Lindbergh. At the time, Lindbergh believed jet propulsion and rocket flight were the most probable next step in aviation. 
Goddard met Lindbergh at Clark University and was impressed by the flyer's interest and Lindbergh was immediately impressed by Goddard's research. Lindbergh suggested to Goddard that he find additional funding for his studies and put his famous name to work. In the spring of 1930, Lindbergh finally found an ally in the Guggenheim family. Financier Daniel Guggenheim agreed to fund Goddard's research over the next four years. By late 1929, Goddard had begun attracting additional notoriety with his experiments in rocketry. With new funding, Goddard relocated to Roswell, New Mexico. In Roswell, Goddard worked with a team of technicians in near isolation and relative secrecy for years. Here they would not endanger anyone and would not be bothered by the curious or his mocking critics. He began experimenting with gyroscopic guidance and made a flight test of such a system in 1932. A gyroscope was mounted on gimbals which electronically controlled steering vanes in the exhaust, similar to the system used by the German V2 over 10 years later. A critical breakthrough was the use of the steam turbine nozzle invented by the Swedish inventor Gustav de Laval. Using de Laval's nozzle, Goddard began to work on a series of rockets which were larger and were intended to reach very high altitudes. Goddard launched his L-13 rocket that reached an altitude of 2.7 kilometers, the highest of any of Goddard's rockets. Dr. Goddard experimented with many of today's features found in larger rockets, such as multiple combustion chambers and nozzles. From 1940 to 1941, Goddard experimented with rockets which used propellant turbopumps. Most of his work involved static tests, which are a present-day standard procedure before a flight test. Simply reaching high altitudes, however, was not his primary goal. He was attempting with a methodical approach to perfect his liquid fuel rocket engine and subsystems so that his rocket could eventually function without having systems failure in the upper atmosphere. He had built the necessary turbo pumps and was on the verge of building larger, more reliable rockets to reach extreme altitudes when World War II intervened and changed the path of American history. In general, there was a lack of vision and serious interest by the United States government concerning the potential of rocketry, especially in Washington. The Navy eventually secured Goddard services to build liquid fuel rockets for a jet-assisted takeoff of aircraft, which is still used today. In the spring of 1945, Goddard saw a captured German V-2 ballistic missile. After a thorough inspection, Goddard was convinced that the Germans had stolen his work. Though the design details were not exactly the same, the basic design of the V-2 was similar to one of Goddard's rockets. Following World War II, when asked about his own work, Werner von Braun stated, Don't you know about your own rocket pioneer? Dr. Goddard was ahead of us all. Dr. Robert Goddard died August 10, 1945 at age 62 from throat cancer. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center is named after Dr. Goddard in honor of his legacy and accomplishments in engineering. Goddard's early rocket engines and other experiments sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution were the beginning of modern rocketry and ultimately space exploration. Early on, Goddard built and tested experimental ion thrusters, which he thought could potentially be used for the propelling of rockets in the near vacuum conditions of outer space. They are. On July 17, 1969, the day after the launch of the Apollo 11, 49 years after viciously mocking Goddard, the New York Times, in the article A Correction, dismissed the notion that a rocket could not function in a vacuum as suggested by Dr. Robert H. Goddard, the rocket pioneer. The correction goes on to state, Further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century and is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as in the atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. These years brought maturity and understanding to the wife of a man who had long withstood skepticism and ridicule with serene and steadfast confidence in the value of his work. Watching him work, I came to know that my husband marched to his own drum. However belated, the recognition accorded to Dr. Goddard is eminently deserved. Like other scientists working in novel and little understood fields, venturing into unknowns, fraught with hazards, he did not live to see the fruits of his successful work. And in the light of what has happened since his death, we can only wonder what might have been if America realized earlier the implications of his work. I have not the slightest doubt that the United States today would enjoy unchallenged leadership in space exploration had Dr. Goddard received adequate support and recognition. And so, remember him well.